Hello, and welcome to the Partnership Projects NVR podcast. This is season three, number four. I'm Sheila Desai. And I'm Peter Jacob. And before we go into today's topic, I uh, just wanted to announce to our listeners a very special one day conference that's being held in Birmingham on the 12th of September. And it's entitled Past, Present and Future of MVR. It's a low cost um, conference for all our practitioners. Um, there's details on our website and I'll also um, the details will also be on the link attached to this podcast. So we really welcome any of our listeners to, to, to that conference. Okay, so Sheila, I understand that we will be speaking about situational mutism and NVR today. And um, I was just going to ask you to maybe um, tell the listeners how um, that theme came up and to sort of, um, yeah, perhaps, you know, perhaps share how that may be relevant for our work. Okay. Well, we had uh, a question from one of our listeners. Um, it's always great when our listeners pose questions and make, and bring issues to us. And the question was really about um, what are our thoughts around how NVR can help children who are withdrawn or who are, as you say, experiencing situational mutism and for whom communication is difficult? And this idea of there isn't any violence, but there's what what's described as shut down. And how can parents, how can practitioners um, kind of enter the world of the child um, or the young person when they want to close, when the young person wants to close literally and metaphorically in their communication, in their interaction with the world? So I think this is such a huge, huge topic and such a something that we come across more and more, this kind of shut down. MVRs off, was often seen as part of working with the externalised presentations, um, whereas now we're seeing more and more of, of parents, practitioners struggling with uh, young people who have withdrawn, withdrawn into their bedrooms, withdrawn from school, um, refusing to communicate using words. Um, and I suppose I had a couple of areas to think about. Um, and one of those was around, I know before we started, we talked to, we were talking about culture, um, culture and culture um, and nature. And just thinking about you know, the cultural ideas around um, silence and withdrawing um, and how... What happens? Um, what are the pressures in our kind of Western cultures when young people are refusing to communicate um, verbally or engage in the world or, or participate in the world? What does what 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 is it in our culture that puts so much pressure to be connected to the world? So. So that's one of that's kind of macro, I guess. And then there's also the ho the whole issue for our parents about how do they then, you know, enter the world of the young person. So I suppose those were two areas that I was sort of interested in exploring today. What about for you, Peter? Well, <laughs> I was just thinking that your intro was so rich <laughs> in themes. We yeah. could probably have a whole. Uh, ten episode uh, series you. on the on the issues yeah. that you've raised. Yeah. So yeah. maybe rather than coming up with my own considerations, uh, I might just want to speak to some of the things that you have just raised. Yeah, because uh, I think they're so salient. I mean, one thing was that you spoke about the difference between externalizing difficulties and these particular kinds of internalizing problems that we're seeing more and more and how NVR was originally conceptualized for child to parent violence and has since spread into so many different areas and uh, is sort of 
being spoken of as a transdiagnostic approach. We're not interested in an indication of NVR for a particular problem as diagnosed. What we're interested in is can the young people, can the parents, can the siblings, um, can they benefit at this moment in time from the young person's direct therapy? And if they don't, then what are the avenues that NVR uh, opens up? What are the possibilities NVR creates on the basis of one-sided action? Uh, I guess that started with the emergence of the space model Mm -hmm. for um, young people with uh, anxiety-related difficulties who often are not acting with aggression or violence, Mm. but who, for whatever reason, will not or cannot make good use of direct intervention involving them. And it has spread into so many other areas. I'm thinking of Dan Dahlberger's work with adult entrenched dependency with uh, the younger adult living in the parent's home, uh, often very socially withdrawn, living almost entirely uh, on the internet um, and ending up not contributing. And, I guess since COVID, we've seen more and more younger young people uh, in their rooms, uh, rarely leaving their rooms, shifting night and day, you know, being awake at night and uh, asleep during the daytime. So even withdrawing online from their mates from their mates who perhaps live more locally because their mates are asleep at night or Mm -hmm. at least part of the night. And so I think we've sort of discovered how not only useful NVR is in those instances, but absolutely necessary. But I'm also thinking of the issue that you raised about this wider context. What you know, this question that you've raised about, you know, what is it that perhaps um, stimulates this um, withdrawal in so many young people? What is it in our society? And I, I don't know whether I have any answers. I, I, I can just speak of what I notice uh, in in some instances, I mean, what comes to my mind uh, by way of of what I notice is young people who feel that particularly uh, in dealing with social media, they have, um, they have uh, not as much agency as they, they, they would need to have, or young people who uh, at school, feel that um, they be, they risk becoming excluded or maybe they don't feel they have a place or belong. I, I think the pressures can be tantamount. Um, and in some instances, it has then made sense for young people to withdraw and perhaps construct around them a world that is different from what they face out there and yet what becomes a solution becomes a kind of prison as well Mm -hmm. many young people become imprisoned in the way they try to solve such pressures and their parents their siblings maybe their friends to some extent become imprisoned Mm -hmm. along Those are just thoughts that come to my mind. I think that when you use the word imprisoned in, you know, young, young people trying to come to some, some solutions to the pressures that they've experienced from outside by withdrawing into their 
home, into their rooms, you know, it starts off as a solution. And if we're thinking interactionally, um, loving parents in supporting their child's distress can maintain that solution by, you know, making that more comfortable, you know, mm-hmm. making the bedroom environment more comfortable, you know, if they're f- afraid that they, their child is re- not coming down to eat, they can mm-hmm. bring food to their rooms, they can, you know, access um, clothes and all kinds of, um, you know, through the post, which parents could bring to their rooms, you know, so you don't even have to go out to shop for anything. So, so that you can, and, you know, when we're thinking about the space approach and that accommodating cycle, mm-hmm. uh, that can that develops between you know loving parents in their attempts to keep their y- young person's needs met then becomes part of the problem and i think that when you describe the young person becoming imprisoned what we've also seen is p- families becoming imprisoned that yeah. they begin to withdraw from um, their own network one parent may stop working because it's too much, which puts pressure on the other parent if there are two parents. They may withdraw from um, their family, their friends, because of uh, potentials of judgment, you know, of um, critical, you know, you talk about the critical, prescriptive um, sort of comments. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the whole family can become imprisoned. And, and when you talked about the young person at this point is not able to access directly. I think a place where NVR has a space is that parents and the caring community can access mm-hmm. NVR. Not in bar- behalf of, but to resist this imprisonment. And I guess NVR has always been adjusted mm. um, to specific situations so we we sort of work on the basis of some certain underlying principles and also a kind of methodology that parents can avail themselves of yet mm-hmm. we've always had to develop adaptations and I, personally I, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, withdrawal and becoming selectively mute I do have a lot of experience with withdrawal, both of adults in their entrenched dependency and of adolescents. And I have a lot of experience of uh, working with suicidal behavior, young people who have made suicide attempts where there is a risk of suicide. And what you say about how the family becomes trapped or imprisoned um, and how parents accommodate or more and more. Um, I see that all the time and I see how parents are terrified mm. and therefore accommodate. And yeah. Ter- it, it would be far from my mind to think that there is anything wrong with these parents because I would probably feel and respond in very similar ways. So um, I can only think there, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, And yet at the same time, it is that very process of becoming more and more accommodating that can feed into the difficulties the whole family experience experiences so to me there are, there are questions around how does NVR need to adapt how does it need to be adjusted what do we need to introduce into NVR to help um these families with the more internalizing difficulties. And I guess one thing that comes to my mind, uh, and and, and I'm going back in my thinking to Milton Erickson's forms of of therapy and the utilization principle, Milton Erickson felt that and did 
use anything a client did, including so-called symptomatic behavior, in a positive way. Because he worked on the very respectfully on the assumption that anything a client does makes sense. Mm -hmm. Even if it is ultimately counterproductive, it, it is an attempted solution, and we must appreciate that. And if we don't appreciate that, we, we don't respect our clients. Mm -hmm. And the utilization means we look at how it makes sense and then look at opening up channels for the energy that goes into the problematic behavior to be redirected into more constructive behavior. And I'm just wondering if we think of that principle how does that pan out in NVR? You know, to me, is the, the question is, can we help parents both to resist that imprisonment, to de-accommodate, as, you know, we say in the space model, and at the same time to acknowledge and to appreciate that where these counterproductive energies originally came from in their child was a place of wanting to solve the challenges they were faced with and that overburdened them. And I think as you're, as you're talking about these adaptations and that kind of both and, both resisting and acknowledging, mm. thinking method, you know, in terms of methods about how the announcement could be written in a in a different way mm -hmm. that both shares at the beginning an appreciation of the struggle that the young person has been through over yeah. X number of months or years and their attempts to try to come to some solution in their own way. But the parent talks talk writes about that in the announcement through the parents' eyes. Mm -hmm. What seen what they've witnessed in terms of their their child's str struggle to overcome the challenges mm -hmm. and then another part of uh, of the the announcement being you know connected to the space space approach but about you know what contribution the parents have made to maintain mm -hmm. that problem and what they're going to do from now on that's different what the parents are going to do, what I am going to do, which I think will shift from the you that is in some of the externalised um, announcements because you mentioned a really important word, which is around pressure, that the pressure is a, a contribution to mutism, to social withdrawal. And if the announcement has more about I as the parent, not, not a, we often talk about we in NVR, but being really clear about if the we is we, the parents, we, your mum and dad, we, your mum and aunt. So being really clear about what they are going to do. And I, I've been toying with this idea about how the, some feedback I've had from parents with in internalised presentation is that the externalised style of, of, of the announcement is, is a little too harsh. Mm. And something around almost some a little bit more collaborative in the announcement that says, you know, we will be doing some things differently. We'd really like to to, to sh have some, some, you know, to share some of these ideas with you about how we do things differently. Not and not not kind of from now on we will do, you know, we will, you know, with stop bringing food to your bedroom or you know not not that kind of instructive but more kind of you know kind of that this is this is a journey this is going to take time and how can we together have some ideas so I think that was something about changing the structure of the announcement that kind of dialogue um, that is so important that that communicating when your child or your young person is not responding, is not communicating back. So. And so much in what you've just said. <laughs> I guess the first person plural 
the we and the extensive use of the we in the announcement and in other ways of communicating with the young person in NVR was born out of the uh, wish to help unify the adults. Because very often, mm. particularly where a young person acts with violence, we find that um, the adults around the young person um, can be at great odds with each other. So I think it was aimed at unifying parents, at unifying parents and other adults who were becoming their supporters, and in communicating to the young person that the adults are unified, in giving that message. Um, when you think of what I called the campaign of concern, which in the original NVR model is called a message campaign, um, the use of the we is a um, public opinion intention, mm. you know, to share with the young person is public opinion that we do not accept this violence and so forth. So there was a place for that. Mm -hmm. But I think what you've spoken to is certain needs of the young person and needs of the parent that don't need to be an either or, but that can be incorporated, for example, in the announcement in a both and. I think you've spoken to um, the first person uh, messages to the young person or to the child, which I guess I'd like to bring in the word mentalizing. You know, if they write, we believe I have often experienced you as, you know, doing this, that, or the other. Maybe you feel like this. Maybe this is what's going on for you. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is what's going through my mind. I think it perhaps addresses a need of the young person, which is to feel listened to. And I don't know how that connects with mutism, you know, when you no longer speak, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, but it would be, it would be something, I guess, to follow up, that need to feel listened to. But at the same time, you've spoken about the parents speaking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I, I was thinking the parent returns, because so often with these difficulties, the parents feel erased. And we, we've spoken about that mm -hmm. understanding of erasure quite a few times on this podcast, mm -hmm. this sense that I do not exist any longer, my, my wants, my values, my intentions, my wishes, my self-care, my other care for my partner, maybe my husband, my wife, I don't know. Um, it's as if all that no longer mattered, and perhaps I no longer matter. I no longer matter as a parent. I no longer matter as a person. To bring that back, not in opposition to the young person, but simply alongside of communicating, we're listening to you. We're trying to understand you, you know, and you mentioned offering dialogue mm -hmm. and it's, it seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Because in NVR, we promote one-sided action where dialogue is not possible, but I would always insert the word yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that offering dialogue without trying desperately hard to make dialogue come about without banging one's head against the wall can be seen as a form of resistance. You have, you've cut off that dialogue, but we will offer dialogue again and again and again, and we will persist. We will persevere. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, one of the key virtues, isn't it, in NVR? that we would like to support parents to cultivate mm -hmm. perseverance. Mm -hmm. I think a more 
antiquated word could be forbearance. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you, you carry on under hardship. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you're inflexible and always exactly do the same thing in the same way, but it does mean that you stick with it yeah. again and again and again. And I guess that parent who returns who comes out of erasure Mm. and who perseveres, I wonder how they communicate themselves to the young person as their presence increases. I I would, you know, of course we don't know if the young person won't talk. (laughs) Well, I guess something that you've talked about in terms of energy and perseverance and how do parents continue to offer that, the dialogue offering conversations question and I think we one of the ways is more through statements than questions Mm -hmm. so less kind of probing of the whys or the where's or the when's but more you know short sentences that kind of acknowledge you know and the tone of the voice Mm -hmm. um you know that we're here you know your dinner is downstairs or hey you know we're doing such and such downstairs. You know, it'd be really nice if you come down. Yeah. Love you. you know, these kind of statements that aren't loaded with expectation or pressure. Hmm. And the other thing I was thinking about in terms of um, parents being able to um, experience their strength and resources temporarily from others in order to gain energy to return back to their young person, their child. So in terms of adaptations, thinking about just a few supporters, you know, who aren't going to be commenting. Has she, have, have they come down yet? Have they done that yet? You know, you're doing too much for them, but we'll come round and that the young person can hear sounds, laughter, you know, that the, the mutism has not spread throughout the house is also an act of resistance. And that these supporters are welcomed, are welcome to knock on the door, are welcome to leave a little something. You know, we talk about these relational gestures without any expectation. So that I see it also as an act of resistance and bringing sound and life back into the home. I love the way you said that. Um, And there's so many kinds of silence, aren't there? Mm. And, uh, I mean, I think of the silence that isn't actually silence when I'm out in nature, you know, that I love hiking and trekking. And and it appears to be silent, but then you hear wind, you hear animals. So there is... There may not be voices of humans, but there are other voices. And then I think of the, I think of the sounds in the house. I think of what I feel when I hear my wife singing in the kitchen or, mm-hmm. you know, in the living room, so in a different room from the one I'm in, mm-hmm. and how I feel. And then I was sort of, <laughs> do you remember the song about the sounds of silence? Yes, yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. The cancer silence grows, you know? So that silence, it's its likened to a cancer. It just spreads and spreads and spreads. And I think you've just spoken about reversing that, you know? So we will, and that's a form of de-accommodation, isn't it? When I invite people into the house, maybe parents don't even realize how still it has become. Yes. Maybe they don't even always appreciate the silence mm. that has grown until they bring people back yeah. in the yeah. house. Yeah. I really, I, that's such an interesting, I'm aware of time, but I just wanted to share a personal story uh, which connects to culture around kind of silence and how you can still be very present in your community and in your life where where there is less talking and I'm thinking about my grandfather in India and growing up 
I would often hear the men in India in this village would go down to the bus stop, which is the equivalent of the pub, in the evenings, and they'd all sit around, cross-legged, maybe on the floor, on the wall, and they'd chat. And growing up, I would always hear, oh, your granddad's gone down to the bus stop. So I had this image of him being really sociable, really chatty, you know, had all these, all these people. He went every night. And I found out later in life that he would go down to the bus stop they would all be sitting quite close together, all the men, they'd be around 10 to 20, but he always sat, you know, far away from all, everyone, and he never spoke. <laughs> and yet he went every day. And I was thinking, you know, what is it in terms of the conditions and the environment that means that he still goes every day? He's still welcome without any pressure to talk. And I was thinking about some of um, his virtues and qualities that they all know about. They don't talk about him being mute or not speaking. They talk about him as the, the snake, the, the, the lead snake killer of the village. Uh -huh. As a grandfather, as a wealthy farmer, as a, you know, all these attributes that he has. Um, and that's what they see when he comes down and sits on the wall, you know, 10 feet away from them and doesn't say anything. And then goes walking back up with his stick like a sage, you know, and his white cloths, you know. And um, and I was thinking about when young people are in their rooms, that they may be learning and discovering things that are of virtue and of value still. And how can parents hold on to that? And I was thinking of um, a parent who spoke to me about their young person who had been out of school for two years and then went on to sixth form and big sixth form, hadn't been in contact with any young person for two years and navigated the, the subjects or break times, the, um, the friendships and... Um, and I asked them, how did they manage to do that? And they said, Minecraft. I, went, mm -hmm. oh. I said, well, in the room, they're watching and playing with, uh, with other people. They're team working. And then on Minecraft, it's an open world. So they're having to um, orientate themselves and navigate this open world, getting lost, finding their way back, problem solving, um, coordinating, you know, um, the geography, the landscape. And these skills, when they had withdrawn, they used later on. And I thought that also is a message of kind of the values and virtues that young people may be growing in their bedrooms that might not always be visible. So I just... And that would make me feel that it is so important not to demonize what the young person does up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even in a prison um, of their room, but to look at what can be valued. It's not about mm. expunging the one in favor of the other. It's about... Mm working towards a balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing I was just thinking of a very practical uh, aspect, um, and I don't know to what degree that could be applicable specifically to the topic of mutism, but I do know it is very applicable in a more general sense where young people are withdrawn and um, self-excluding. And that is to use the campaign of concern um, in a very particular way. I advocate the one to three rule for mm -hmm. every one set of messages about a difficult or problematic incident, there are at least three messages for exceptions that draw attention to exceptions. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, and more and more, I'm working with only exception campaigns. Nice. I, I often find it's not even 
often necessary to draw attention to problematic behavior if we draw attention to exceptions to problematic behavior. And to do that in a very specific way, which is to um, not to praise, mm. because praising young people for the exceptions mm. will merely create mm. pressure and perhaps uh, shame them unnecessarily. But to acknowledge, mm. to express appreciation through acknowledgement. You know, I. I saw the pictures of you and your cousin um, going out, and I heard you talked about um, this or that. Well, I, I came up, I came across this link on that topic, mm -hmm. and emailing the link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and and to think very carefully about those messages, and very to be thoughtful about how we convey them and what we convey such a message about. <clears throat> I, I, I do believe that that is an important aspect. I think that we could have another podcast topic think, talking about exceptions and praise. Um, mm. I think that would be a great one. So I think our listeners would be interested in that. Uh, I would be very interested in having that conversation with you, Peter. I think it's been a really rich discussion today i hope our listeners um will also find um, some nuggets in in today and just just a reminder to the listeners again about um our one day conference in september and you know follow the link for that um and i'll say goodbye from me and goodbye from me